Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us again for our monthly United States Geological Survey virtual public lecture. Uh, and if it's your first time joining us, if you haven't been here before, uh, we'd like to welcome you to the series. My name is Christy Ryan, and I will be your host and moderator for our lecture tonight. Before we get started, I want to take a few minutes to go over a few things about this Teams Live platform, just in case it's your first time using it, and also want to give you some information on our next lecture. So one great feature about this Teams Live platform is that you can use the Q&A panel to submit questions for our speaker at any point during the lecture. Just look for the question mark icon in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Uh, we encourage you to submit questions all throughout the lecture as you think of them. You don't have to wait till the end. Then at the end of the lecture, uh, I'll go ahead and ask the speaker your questions and we'll do our best to get to everything that's come in. Another feature we want to direct your attention to is closed captioning. If you're on a desktop computer, just look at the bottom right hand corner of the screen for the closed caption icon, the two little C's. You can also use the live captioning link that I put in the Q&A window uh, for stream text and you can watch the captions live. And just one more quick thing before we get started is I did want to give you a heads up about our lecture for next month. On October 19th at 6 p.m. Pacific time, we will have the pleasure of welcoming Han Ip, a diagnostic virologist with the USGS, and the tentative title of his talk, which is just in time for Halloween, is Zombies or the Workings of a Federal Science Laboratory, all about the National Wildlife Health Center. So please mark your calendars and join us then. At the end of this lecture, I will give you information on how to join our mailing list uh, so you'll always know what's coming up month to month. So now that we've gotten all that out of the way, let's get started with the lecture for tonight. Um, our speaker, we have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Ole Kavan. He's a research geophysicist at the USGS's Earthquake Science Center, where he leads basic and applied research in induced seismicity and reservoir deformation in geothermal resources. He's an expert in micro seismic analysis and runs various dedicated seismic arrays to investigate deformation in both ESG stimulation, which you'll find out about in the lecture, and CO2 sequestration projects. He's also an expert in coupled flow and deformation geomechanical modeling, got that right, specifically focused within fracture and fault mechanics. And I'm sure you're wondering what all that's about, but I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Coven to explain it. And Ole, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Christy, for the kind introduction. And thank you so much for uh, producing and hosting it. You and Amelia, I really appreciate it. Uh, the title of the talk today is Geothermal Energy Research within the USGS, Goldilocks for Electricity but, no, with Earthquakes in Between. Uh, the goal of this talk is not to give a comprehensive overview of all the research related to, um, uh, related to geothermal energy within the USGS. There's way too much going on. I approach this topic from a slightly different um, vantage point than my colleagues in the energy resources program because I'm interested in the deformation and earthquakes. And so um, that's what I uh, want to talk about today. I'm going to explain why we really need Goldilocks conditions and how we might be able to get around it. But uh, none of this work uh, would, would have been able uh, without um, a lot of support from folks both within the USGS and outside. And I, I want to specifically mention here Steve Hickman, Colin Williams, and Ernie Major from LBNL. Um, I had a wonderful conversation with Patrick Muffler, who will be uh, featured throughout this talk, who is an emeritus scientist within uh, the uh, USGS and is one of the early pioneers of geothermal energy research in the USGS and assessments. Um, but I also want to thank my current collaborators, Gemma Erdem and Simone Yiga. Without them, a uh, collection of data at uh, various seismic networks would not be possible. Uh, some of the work you're going to see here is um, from other outside research partners or in conjunction with other research partners. I also want to acknowledge the Navy Geothermal Program Office and Fervo Energy, uh, with whom we've collaborated over a number of years now. So I want to start this talk by saying that 
geothermal energy research is is a really exciting uh, exciting scientific topic because so many different disciplines from within earth sciences are involved. And uh, as Christy mentioned, my start was in um, geomechanics of faulting and fractures. And so when I started my Mendenhall a long, long time ago, my goal was to understand how faults interact in geothermal reservoirs. It became very um, apparent very quickly that um, it's not quite so easy. And I got sucked into micro seismic analyses, which I've spent most of my time on over the last uh, decade plus um, at the USGS. OK, so uh, the outline of the talk is as follows. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about how and um, that why we should care about it in the first place. I'll mention that the Pacific, uh, the scientific pursuit alone, uh, to me at least and many of my colleagues, is well worth it. Um, but it combines um, because it combines a, a variety of subdisciplines from within our sciences. But there is another uh, maybe more important argument to be made to conduct research in geothermal regions as it's beneficial to the nation as a whole because it can expand um, the energy resource portfolio and add a green sustainable source of energy. Um, for us, for all of us at the USGS, uh, our main stakeholder is the public. So um, we um, thank you for being engaged in this public lecture and um, you know take this very seriously. Uh, they aren't just the resources aren't just uh, fascinating scientifically and have practical benefits, um, but um, it is really a situation of you know if it's just a little bit too much of one good thing, then you get a geyser that's shown on the bottom here. If you get a little bit um, too little of a certain thing, then you get a center deposit. So geothermal uh, resources really are very specific, very um, complicated settings um, that are that are really interesting and hence in the title Goldilocks and I'll try to explain why why that is. Given the complicated nature um, of its occurrence, um, uh, geothermal energy exploration has a long history of trying to engineer the settings and I'll show some of that um, historic background and some that's just hot off the press. Um, and finally, by the time um, we get to the end of the um, talk, you'll probably be sick of my enthusiasm for this topic. So I'm going to make sure to point out that there uh, that there are some issues with geothermal exploration and um, engineering these settings. Um, but there are also ways that within the USGS and outside we're, we're trying to um, develop to um, mitigate those issues. And then finally, I want to sort of end with um, what what the actual influence on the energy portfolio might be uh, within the US. Um, and so the picture on the right is from Lottarello, Italy. It's a very proud um, group of men uh, that have just drilled the geothermal well that is steaming um, energy there. And then on the bottom is a geyser that is also steaming, but it's a natural feature. And, and I think I can Convinced you the, convince you throughout the talk that both the naturally occurring hydrothermal features like you'd expect you'd see in um, a Yellowstone National Park, for example, and geothermal resources are very closely related. And a lot of the basic research that came out of the USGS started with those types of resources. So um, why should we care? Um, there's a long archaeological, um, there's, there's a lot of archaeological evidence that Places like Yellowstone, Geysers, and Coso Geothermal Field in California have played a vital role to the well being of uh, Native people. Um, some of the records date back as far as 15,000 years. It's the abundance of both warm water and co location of volcanic rocks, mostly obsidian, for tool making that often made geothermal areas into hubs of settlement and trade, not just in Yellowstone, but other. Uh, geothermal areas as well, where naturally occurring hydrothermal and geothermal activity takes place. The picture on the top right is the famous obsidian cliffs in Yellowstone National Park, and that has been used for tool making, or the obsidian from it has been used for tool making by Native people for a long time. And the same is true in places like the geysers in Northern California and Coso in Southeastern California. And many local tribes have frequented these areas for trade and gathering, but they've also 
risen um, to the level of being um, spiritual sanctuaries and areas for ceremony and healing. Economic use of geothermal fluids goes back many centuries as well. And the first recorded commercial use of direct geothermal in the US is reported to have been um, a hot spring in Arkansas uh, in 1830 that fetched about $1 for the use of three spring fed baths in a wooden tub. In 1892 in Boise, Idaho, the first direct use of district heating was built by piping warm water from nearby hot springs to heat some 200 homes and 40 downtown businesses. Similar installation followed in Klamath Falls, the Oregon and near Reno. The first geothermal resource used for production of electricity um, took place in Lauderello, Italy in, in 1904. And so um, these are the pictures on the bottom right. This is a picture from Lauderello um, that was used there. The picture on the top on the left side is actually from the geysers um, in the uh, late 1800s. So early uses, I've already mentioned Lauderello, Italy. Um, the first geothermal power plant in the world uh, was built in Tuscany in Lauderello in 1904. Um, the uh, Prince Piero Ginori Conti uh, was the first one to um, create a geothermal energy generator. And it was a dry steam field. And uh, these are very rare. But because it was a dry steam field and it uh, was able to produce, had basically a high enthalpy, was able to produce about 10 kilowatts of energy and power about five light bulbs at the time. From these very humble beginnings of Lauderello, um, Conti's generator eventually um, was expanded in 1911. Uh, the area of Devil's Valley was the first geothermal power plant that was completed there in 1913. And uh, finally, the first power plant that had an installed capacity of about 250 kilowatts. It was at the time used to power the Italian railway system in nearby villages. The picture on the bottom left here is actually from the geysers in Northern California. In 1921, John Grant drills a first well um, intending to generate electricity. He drilled to about 200 feet and uh, got a blowout. Blowout means he hit an area of high pressure and it blows out the well. And so that was fairly unsuccessful. He was able to go back a year later and drill another well and uh, put the first <clears throat> uh, uh, first United States geothermal pla power plant into operation. Uh, the um, plant is um, at the time not quite competitive with other sources of power and falls into disuse. Um, it comes back online in 1960 when PGE completes Unit 1, the first commercial geothermal electric unit in the Western Hemisphere, and it generated initially 11 megawatts of electricity and uh, has quickly expanded to 82 megawatts at the end of the, um, end, end of the decade. Boise um, continued its development of direct use um, and geothermal um, um, applications in, in uh, 1890, as I mentioned before, and then in 1983, the city of Boise actually started a geothermal heat system that is now part of the largest municipally operated system in the country, heating um, 90 buildings in, in downtown um, yeah, in downtown Boise. Okay, so how is geothermal energy used today? Uh, heat pumps um, are uh, growing uh, significantly. The numbers on the bottom right here are 1.4 million with 7% growth. That's from 2015. Those numbers have certainly increased. But these are energy efficient alternatives to furnaces or air conditioner for all climates. Just like your refrigerator, heat pumps use electricity to transfer heat from a cool space to a warm space. So in summer, putting warm, um, warm um, air down into the ground and pumping colder fluids out and vice versa. A large project within the USGS is dedicated to underground thermal energy storage. Again, this is like a heat pump, just on a much, much larger scale. And um, it basically operates on the same principle, uh, but it has a very large storage capacity of natural underground sites, and it can be used for very long-term and seasonal storage. 
Um, underground storage can officially store thermal energy from a variety of sources, including summer and winter ambient air, solar energy, byproduct of waste, heat from industrial and other cooling processes, and it can store it underground for a long time. Direct use, of course, is um, something that's been in um, use for quite some time. Boise was one of the early adopters of that, and it's been adopted throughout the world as this table on the right shows. Um, and it's generally like the two other heat pump or underground thermal energy storage, restricted to fairly low temperatures, 100 degrees C or about 200, less than 100 degrees C or less than 212 um, F. And so uh, that can be used for a variety of um, applications, greenhouses, direct heating, building heating, or even um, defrosting streets and sidewalks in certain settings. What I'm going to focus on here today is electrical power generation, and that generally requires a heat source that's 150 C or so and greater. And uh, this um, really is, um, is a big portion of how hydrothermal and geothermal research got started within the USGS and how um, we uh, can derive additional um, electricity. So why should we care about um, electricity generated um, from geothermal resources? Well, there's a very large potential for clean, sustainable energy production across much of the Western US. I wanna go into more of the detail of how we get to these numbers um, on the bottom left a little later. But what I wanna show on the bottom right is that geothermal actually is competitive in price with other um, renewable energies and conventional energies. And I'm sorry, my pointer has just lost the uh, laser pointer. Okay. So, as you can see here, it's right in line with other um, conventional coal or gas combined cycle in terms of cost. It's a little bit more expensive than wind or solar utility scale, but it's significantly cheaper than residential rooftop solar. And it has the great benefit of providing a base load that is available 24 hours a day, 360 day, 365 days a year. Um, here are the discovered resources in the US uh, based on Colin Williams' um, assessment from 2008. And there are over 500 megawatts electric installed in California and Nevada. California is actually over 2000 megawatts installed. Um, and there are a number of other states, all of them in the Western US and in Alaska and Hawaii that have significant capacity installed. Um, so why is it such a large and, oops, why is it such a large um, heat source and where does it come from? Well, the this is going way back to geology. So for those of you that come here for basic geologic uh, information, Earth was formed about four and a half billion years ago by a lot of accreting smaller particles. The impact of those, a lot of that energy was converted into heat. Um, then eventually, um, of course, the melting of um, the materials as they collide with one another leads to a stratification that um, has heavier elements sink to the bottom and lighter elements uh, go to the surface. The friction as those elements pass by one another creates an additional source of heat. And of course, um, much like the sun, there's radioactive decay of, of a number of um, elements within uh, the Earth that leads to uh, another heat source. So what that really um, means for us, even on a geologic time scale, it's, it's really an infinite source of heat uh, that we can tap into and, and have to maybe um, not as large of a degree as we can or should. So, so we have a lot of heat. How is it getting through the crust? Um, so this map on the right here is from the National Geothermal Data System, and it's uh, collating um, a number of well observation throughout the Western US. Of course, these are point sources of uh, measurements, and some of them are not as deep as 2000 meters. Actually, you know, very few are, but there are a number of tools developed from these early experiments in um, hydrothermal and geothermal uh, research that, that lend themselves to actually extrapolating temperatures to depth. And then of course, um, really um, novel and complicated methods of actually interpolating spatially in between them. So what we can see, what we can observe, there's a sort of general trend of hotter in the West, cooling to the East is one 
one would expect away from the plate boundary uh, towards the west, towards the uh, central uh, US craton. Um, and with a couple anomalies, of course. Uh, the biggest anomaly um, that sticks out maybe in California is the salt and sea trough. This is an area of extension as it's the northern part of the Gulf of Mexico extension area or rift zone. It's another big portion up here centered around the geysers. And then, of course, more than half of Nevada really has high temperatures um, up to 150 degrees and, and above, and certainly above about 120 or so at 2000 meter steps in, in a large portion of Nevada. I've superposed here the faults because faults will obviously factor very prominently in this talk because it's a research topic that I'm really interested in and I think I, I'll be able to explain that um, and they play an important role in these part of this Goldilocks um, equation, I suppose. So the heat anomalies occur where you have crustal thinning in Nevada. That's the basin and range extension, basically pull apart extension uh, related to uh, the plate boundary. Um, volcanic regions, Yellowstone, of course, is a, a large resource, uh, certainly not one that's going to be economically explored anytime soon, but one that is scientifically extremely um, useful to the geothermal and uh, geothermal community. And then, um, the, as I mentioned already, the extensional basins in salt and sea. There's a few other places where um, they're related to volcanic activity and drifting or um, old drifts in uh, both New Mexico and then in portions of Utah as well. So what, what makes a geothermal resource? Um, well, these figures here are both from Don White with a number of um, other works by his colleagues at the time. And put yourself back into the situation of the 1960s plate tectonics is just sort of arriving as the new paradigm, a true paradigm shift of how geology works. And um, it is um, an area of active research within the USGS um, by a number of different people. Uh, Don White being one of them. The other folks that uh, really factor prominently in the development of our understanding of geothermal resources and hydrothermal resources are Bob Fournier, Patrick Muffler, who I already mentioned, Art Lackenbrook, and Alfred Truesdell, of course. So at the time, Don White was, um, and was working at both Yellowstone and Steamboat Springs, and he and his colleagues really developed the sort of framework, the geological framework of how um, oops, how these systems work. So in the simplest form, in Yellowstone, you have a convecting magma, that's your heat source. You have some type of conductive um, heat transfer through the rocks, but you have faults right here in these areas. Let me just see if the printer is there. You have faults in these areas and they factor in prominently. Then above that, there's um, some permeable rock. And above that is a rock with low permeability. So what is happening in these places and what he and his colleagues figured out that meteoric water, so water from the surface, whether it's runoff, lakes, um, rain or whatever, percolate down into the crust along faults, fractures or areas of low perme high permeability, get to an area where they can heat up, they get heated up and then transferred up and come up at the surface as either a hot spring or a geyser. And so um, he started this research basically because he was interested in how minerals form and how ore deposits form. And ore deposits really are a hydrothermal system that didn't quite have Goldilocks conditions that eventually seized up because the permeability of the crust um, went away or the heat source went away. So this initially stemmed from uh, trying to find minerals and understanding how they, how they work. So the other thing that he, Don White and Bob Fournier then realized the water that's coming up, obviously it's it's cooling down as it comes up. It interacts with both the host rock and the uh, elements contained within it will um, precipitate out of the fluid at different temperatures. So as it comes up, it cools, certain minerals uh, precipitate, mostly clays, then it cools off, mixes with meteoric water and comes back down. So um at places like yellowstone it's the components the chemical components the geochemistry of the fluids um really indicated that it's meteoric so surface water that percolates through 
right around the same time the Salton Trough geothermal resource was found, and there was actually the brine, the low water, uh, water that's in deeper portions of the rock that has a different type of precipitation and therefore geochemistry that led um, the early researchers to conclude that it's not fed by meteoric water. Um, so that all was, was really important. And the, the same type of implications were uh, found at a, a different type of setting. This is sort of an extensional setting. This is uh, in the Reno, area, Reno Nevada area, uh, Steamboat Springs. And here, basically, you have a fault and extension hosted system with a heat source below. Fluids, again, can percolate down. Meteoric fluids can percolate down. The faults get to the heated source and come back up. And here, the fluid chemistries are very much the same. These fractions of different precipitates and different components within the water, after it was determined that it was meteoric water, um, led Bob Fournier to realize that you can use the composition of fluids as, as a geothermometer. So that the relative compositions of the fluid that are coming up and can be sampled really give an understanding of what the um, resource is, how hot it is at the bottom and what the chemistry is. And again, those types of geothermometers that were developed in these settings in the 60s um, really led, um, led us to make these types of extrapolations as heat for the heat map that I showed a little earlier. So you can see this is a pretty complicated setting. Geochemistry is at play, surface water, um, heat, fluid flow, of course, and faults and fractures are there, so geomechanics are a big portion of it. And so the ingredients are, again, we need crustal thinning or magmatic anomaly where there's a shallow heat. We need fluids, meteoric, um, in certain places like salt and trough, they can be brine, deep brines that get circulated as they come up. We need a permeable crust that can maintain the permeability. If it doesn't maintain the permeability and the precipitates, the clays, kaolinites, and so on, clog up all the pores, then no more circulation can take place and uh, you, you might end up with sinter deposits. So um, not too much of a deposit, but enough of a deposit to actually keep temperatures and pressures um, uh, below high enough so you need a bit of a cap rock that actually keeps pressures and temperatures below. So this is really, these are really Goldilocks conditions that do not exist in many, many places. And here on the right is, is one of the, uh, the geysers at which um, the, the USGS crew from the 60s and 70s did a lot of the research and developed a lot of these. So um, now 55 years later or so, Obviously, we've learned a lot more about a lot of different system and, you know, we get plots and color, which is really nice. So here are really the three different types that have been sort of identified as being geothermal resources. Here's a volcanic source that might be akin to um, the geysers, the coastal geothermal field where you have really high temperatures, um, fairly shallow. Um, you have meteoric waters coming in on the side of your volcano or wherever they may come in. They get heated up, they travel up. The water chemistry changes. It actually forms um, argillic alterations here and clay caps at the top, which keeps the pressures and temperatures and fluids below. They then go down the side of the volcano, come out as either a fumarole or a spring. So that is one of the resources. One indicative of maybe the salt and sea is an extensional system. Again, more or less the same, um, the same system, a heat source at the center, in this case, volcanic right here, faults that allow meteoric water to percolate down. Um, although in the salt and trough, it's um, again, it's um, brines as well that, and conductive heat transfer that has taken place within the geothermal resource. And then coming up, eventually building a clay cap, keeping steam and or hot water um, under that steam cap and being able to drill a well here. This one is more akin of the extensional type of regime that Basin and Range Nevada would look like. Um, thin crust, so conductive heat trans transfer from uh, deeper portions of the crust to the shallow crust where it's fairly hot, fairly shallow. Uh, meteoric water coming down the, the faults, traveling up, getting heated up in, in permeable layers and then traveling up often faults and so on. So um, certainly a lot more understanding 
um, since the early days, but not so different than what um, our colleagues from the USGS back in the day learned. So if we now put this all into favorable locations, so this is a favorability map that comes also out of their uh, resource assessment from Colin Williams in 2008, and I'll talk a little bit more about the details here, but um, it convolves all of these Goldilocks conditions of shallow heat, uh, permeable crust, and uh, the right temperature and geochemistry that allow for sources to be there. And so if we now look at where they are found, salt and trough right here, extensional basis. This is type of this is the type of resource we're looking for there. Volcanic regions, Newberry volcano, uh, geysers to some degree, and coastal geothermal field right here. And then of course here the arrow really means to be this entire area here, an extensional type of setting, an amagmatic geothermal system, but one um, that is hot enough for electricity production as well. Oops. So how do how do faults fit in all of this? So we've seen on the previous picture of heat and the quaternary USGS quaternary fault map that they don't really correlate, and it's really the crustal thinning to extension and whatnot that happen. However, in the shallow crust, it's really the circulation of deep fluids through the shallow crust that, that do this. And Jim Falls, who's at UNR and is the Nevada State Geologist. Um, has written many papers that are nicely summarized in this um, uh, summary paper that recently came out. And he's talking about it's not the actual major fault or main fault that is the host of a geothermal system, but rather it's the complexity of the fault where you have a splay fracture or staling um, that come off, where you have two different faults that intersect and interact with one another, a relay that connect closely spaced extension um, at the at the tips of big strike slip faults, um, or when you have strike slip faults where you have sort of a pull apart basin. And in 3D, it kind of looks in 3D, it kind of looks like this. This is a, where you would target with a blue line here, a region of high temperatures. And so that's where really the, the fault complexity came in. And this is really what got me interested in the first place, the fault mechanics and Geomechanics could help elucidate how this works. So, um, my naive thought at the time was well, if we have a place where we have a geothermal reservoir and lots of seismicity, we can probably understand where the fractures and faults are and how they interact with one another. It could um, have a sustainable, long lasting resource, such as the coastal geothermal field. So, the coastal geothermal field, as is depicted down here, is in southeastern. California, it's sort of um, at a really interesting junction of Eastern California shear zone, um, the uh, basin and range extension and then the Sierra Nevada Bathal is just to the west of it. So it's a geologically very, very interesting point. It um, has a very shallow brittle ductile transition. The red dots here in this plot are seismicity that is very shallow. There's a lot of other seismicity in the in the area around it. The recorded seismicity here is from the Navy Geothermal Program Office, this local network, so we have very good resolution. My thought at the time was if we relocate this catalog, which is to, to say we use the waveform similarity between different events to get very high resolution um, relative um, catalogs, we ought to be able to tease out the faults. And so um, I spent uh, my early years at the USGS trying to uh, do that well, but I keep, kept coming back with this close up view here in map view and here in cross section with the view direction indicated here, that it stays kind of diffuse all the time. And major faults and fractures are actually not elucidated by um, faulting in that area. And so um, I think the take home from here is that, again, uh, what Jim Falls and his colleagues have sort of um, conceptualized in the previous plots is that it really takes a diffuse network of faults and fractures that allow for enough heat exchange area and enough flow through it um, that uh, it remains a viable resource. Additionally, having continuous seismicity is indicative of continuous deformation too. So the precipitation of fluids as they travel through the reservoir is counteracted by constant deformation of, um, of the faults and fractures. And so yeah, if we look at this in more detail, 
I've mentioned some of this, um, the fluid transfer, of course, within the, the reservoir. This is what it looks like at the surface at Coal. So, so there are steaming rocks. These are fault systems right here. And if you put this in a map, as my colleagues Nick DeVazis and Steve Hickman have done, these are the red dots. They line up along one of these smaller faults that, again, also is fairly complicated. The yellow dots here are stress measurements from various wells. The blue lines are quaternary faults mapped in that area. And then all the black dots and lines are producing um, wells in that area. And so the fractures need to continue to deform. And some of the really heterogeneous stress measurements sort of are indicative of that faults in this area and fractures deform all the time, subject to various different stresses. And so um, how can we use the seismicity? Well, it's not really useful in identifying the fractures necessarily. How can we use them to understand the diffuse nature of it? And so here, what I've done, the seismicity I've shown before on the same extent of this map right here, I've summed up all their moments to uh, make this plot of seismic moment release. And this is for 2010 and this is for 2011. So they don't look vastly different. There's a region up here where you have most of the event, most of the magnet moment released. And that actually um, jives with where maybe the, the larger fault is. So if we place this on top here, this is really at the extension of this fault. So the larger moment comes from larger events relatively. These are all small events. And the rest is sort of diffusely distributed and in an area where you have exactly that type of productive region of diffuse seismicity. So again, this is where two faults or two strands of a fault right here and up here connect with one another and form this area of really diffuse seismicity. This is a cross section here. In the example on the left from Coase, it would dip the other way, but it's the same principle. Lots of smaller faults and fractures that provide enough of a heat exchange area to actually allow for continuous uh, production of hot fluids. Okay, so obviously there aren't a whole lot of places where this is possible. So early on, um, after resources like the geysers and the salt and sea were developed, folks thought these Goldilocks conditions are a little bit too difficult, and we've kind of found them because they all steam at the surface. Um, I, I should put as an aside here, there's a big initiative by both the Department of Energy and the USGS to develop these play fairway methods to find blind systems, blind systems being geothermal systems that have no surface expressions. Those are really difficult to find, and it's really expensive to drill a geothermal well, so it's really difficult to convince operators to drill these wells when it's, it's not all that um, certain that there is a resource. But what folks at Los Alamos figured is they would generate the permeability of a geothermal reservoir. So I apologize for the poor reproduction of this plot. Here's an injection well that was used, and then here's a producing well. The sort of lines in Matthew book is they're slightly deviated. And so at the time, this Fenton Hill project got off the ground in the 1970s. The conventional thinking of how you stimulate a reservoir in oil and gases, you stimulate at a near vertical well, you form a penny-shaped crack uh, because the simple Kirsch solution allowed you to um, explore Kirsch solution allowed you to um, understand where it is, and then other analytical methods allowed you to um, inform what types of pressures you need to do those. So the thought was you make a penny shaped crack that would connect the injector and producer, and that would be your heat exchange area. The big um, learning from the Fenton Hill area was actually that faults and fractures deformed in diffuse patterns. And what you really need in areas where you have lots of heat, but no permeability, is you need to stimulate the existing non-permeable fracture network. And that's what Fenton Hill really taught us. Um, another successful stimulation was at Soul Soufferet in France in the 90s that continued on to the 2000s. And again, here the thinking was you stimulate vertical wells, you make an area with seismicity shown here that is really nicely recorded and located. And you basically have two wells that are separated um, horizontally by, in the case of Sol Super 8, 600 meters, and you make um, a heat exchange along these. Um, so this was fairly successful, although the temperatures encountered were somewhat lower. 
So they had to keep drilling deeper, and this is in meters here, so 5,000 meter deep well is, is a serious undertaking, but they did encounter hot temperatures and made the first commercially viable EGS reservoir. There are a couple other attempts that I'll talk about in more detail later. This is Basel, Switzerland in 2006. This was also an EGS, so an enhanced geothermal system uh, project, and then the Bohang EGS project in South Korea of 2017. I'll get to those in a little bit. Um, more recent examples, and this is really the flagship um, operation by the Department of Interior was the FORGE Utah project. So FORGE stands for Frontier Observatory for Research in Geothermal Energy. And the whole goal was rather than having these vertical or sub-vertical wells and stimulating a smaller cloud around them, let's borrow technology from oil and gas and drill near horizontal uh, long-range wells. Um, drill one, stimulate it, create some permeability, and then depending on where the seismicity lies, drill a second one, drill through it, and make it um, an injector and produce a doublet. And so one of the examples that's for research purposes only, that has been uh, fairly successful so far in completing the wells, stimulating and connecting to the producer, having a flow test yield um, results is the Utah Forge site. A second site that's a commercial site is at Blue Mountain, Nevada, that's operated by Fervor Energy. Um, some of you from the Earthquake Science Center that are that are here might remember Jack Norbeck. He co-founded the company. He is a man in all postdocs some years ago with Justin Rubenstein. So the Blue Mountain, Nevada EGS site is adjacent to an already producing geothermal reservoir. This is operated by Cirque Energy. It's a sort of one of these extensional type systems where you have upflow right here along sort of a high permeability portion that comes up to the field and um, you produce from the eastern end of the field. There's cold water flowing down. Some inversions of temperatures are seen in the shallow portions of these producing wells. Um, so this is um, a producing well, a producing reservoir that's been in in operation for quite some years. It, it operates about or produces about 25 megawatts electric. So it's quite a substantial portion. The tricky part at the Blue Mountain site is that the seemingly the southern reservoir boundary across which there's no communication to the wells out here is 7322 or 3423. So Fervo thought um, there's a power plant. Um, we have really good site characterization. Let's try this horizontal doublet of lateral reach wells and build a heat exchanger. And um, this um, this uh, was intended to be sort of the first com commercial EGS project with um, long reach horizontal wells and having actual true horizontal wells. Uh, we partnered with Fervo to do seismic monitoring, mostly for induced seismicity hazard, but also for additional um, research purposes. And so what we saw, we started quite a, quite a ways. This was in 2020 at the start of the pandemic, so things got a little delayed here and there, but it's pretty low background seismicity. We didn't detect a whole lot. Then this is sort of the first, the lower of the horizontal laterals that was injected. So we had a lot of seismicity all of a sudden. Frequency is shown in these red forms and then the magnitudes right here. It died down pretty quickly, um, even though 16 stages were drilled. And then there was the producer stimulation. Unfortunately, there was a casing leak, so it had to be postponed for the completion of it here. And then there was a 30 day flow test. So clearly, the seismicity um, coincided very strongly with the injection and stimulation of these um, lateral wells. And what's shown here is the pressure gauge at that horizontal well that's not a producer or injector, it's just off to the side. So the increases in production uh, in pressure at that well, at, at the well had coincided very, very um, and directly with the seismicity that was observed at the site. And so we we did the monitoring. Um, you might wonder why is the seismic cloud offset of this? This is work hot off the press. We're using a very simple velocity model. Uh, and it's a notably three-dimensional velocity model. So we expect these events to sort of um, eventually migrate over, but the depths are fairly 
convincing as we compared it to DAS um, that was in the, in the um, injector and producer. And so the depth really, would, it was, it, the seismicity was mostly centered around the injector and the producer. And so quite a large area of um, the area to the south that was previously impermeable, uh, seemingly is now permeable. And um, what ended up being revealed in the 30 day flow test, this is a, uh, a model run of what Fermo thinks this looks like um, that matched the observation of the 30 day flow test quite well is that this array of fractures was um, generated by the stimulation, basically by the fracking operation, and then cold injection right here leads to um, extraction of fluids right here. It's about 160 degrees C at the inlet, and then um, about a 30 degree increase in this 150 meters between producer and injector. And so they um, have successfully completed um, this first horizontal doublet and are producing two and a half megawatt electric. Um, the number of new projects that are coming up. So, so far, all of this sounds like it's it's great and we should adopt it everywhere. Well, there's a couple of cases that sort of halted progress for a little bit. In 2006, um, there was a project in Basel, Switzerland, more or less in, this, in, in the city center, and they increased um, and the injection pressure, and then that led to um, a 2.9 earthquake right about here. They shut in the well, meaning they didn't pump in anymore. And a couple of days later, about a week later, there was a 3.4 earthquake, which in Nevada, it might not be a big deal, but in the city center of Basel, a, you know, a metropolis of 700,000 people with lots of old buildings, certainly historic seismicity has occurred, but that's not something um, that the local population wanted to support. So it ended that project. Uh, the more crucial one is probably the 2017 Pohang, South Korea earthquake, where there is some seismicity recorded prior. Mud loss here, this means you encounter a fault or fracture and you lose drilling fluid. So it's uh, an indication that you've hit some structure, or possibly a fault structure. Uh, some earthquakes happen, nothing too worrisome. And then finally, um, when the stimulation actually happens, some pretty significant earthquakes happen with magnitudes over two. Some of the, the pressure was reduced. Uh, and then there's a little bit more injection later on. More earthquakes of higher magnitudes happen. And then finally, a 5.4 earthquake happened. Uh, it caused one fatality and significant economic losses. So induced seismicity, earthquakes can be helpful, as I think I've shown before, but earthquake, earthquakes can also be um not beneficial so we need to figure out how to actually mitigate the hazard from earthquakes and a lot of work has gone into this how you plan for an earthquake uh, the department of um, energy has released the best practices document that um, really is outlining seven steps of how you properly uh, plan for an egs project and plan for the seismicity and mitigate the seismicity. And some of the things that come into play there and do seismicity mitigation plans, probabilistic seismic hazard modeling. And for one of these projects, it was Port of Forge. Port of Forge, um, we actually um, ran simulations of what type of seismicity might be uh, produced by one of these doublets and what the tectonic, uh, what the seismic hazard due to the injection might be related to this tectonic hazard. In this case, it was fairly low. Um, but the one thing that, you know, is really important as I think the cases of Basel and Poland have shown is that we have to have a plan of what you do when you get big earthquakes. So on the bottom here is uh, shown the traffic light numbers that were imposed for the Blue Mountain Fervo project. Um, a yellow light basically saying halt what you're doing or whatever your mitigation strategy is, was set at two, which is very conservative. And then at three is sort of your red light where you stop um, action. So um, that's been um, luckily not an issue at the Fervo side, and it's, uh, you know, really um, has been a really um, successful uh, portion or development of a geothermal resource. But it is not without risk and it's not without hazard. 
And the most important part, and this comes out of uh, learnings from the geysers and geothermal field, is that the transparent communication of the hazard and what is going on is really key. Um, the geysers have a long history of having um, a very regular meetings with the local population, even having the fund to reimburse people should an earthquake happen within the reservoir. So there are ways to mitigate and um, and plan for the um, event of earthquakes that might occur. So I, I would be uh, very remiss if I didn't mention that these geothermal resource assessments um, are a huge portion of uh, geothermal research within the USGS. This came on the heels of the energy crisis of the 70s where the USGS was tasked with ge geothermal research assessment led by Patrick Muffler. Um, and this basically was drawing on research assessment experience in mineral or fuel, oil, gas and coal, uh, meaning fuel um, assessments that the USGS um, does a lot of in the energy resources program. But obviously, Given these Goldilocks conditions, at least at the time in the 70s when it was naturally occurring um, places, the Goldilocks conditions needed to be uh, accounted for. So the things that really go into it, it's the reservoir volume, which for geothermal reservoirs is generally small. The extractable heat, how hot is it? Is it a vapor dominated, liquid dominated reservoir? How can you recover it? And that's the part where again, fractures play a huge, hugely important role the various models of how you actually assess what the recovery factor might be. And there's a huge range of these recovery factors from actual geothermal reservoirs. And then the utilization efficiency is really how well can you turn steam or hot water into electricity? And there it depends if it's dry steam like the geysers, you can run that through the turbines. Depending on the chemistry, that might be a little abrasive. A lot of the Intermediate temperature reservoirs run um, binary cycles where a secondary fluid with a lower flash point is used to run the turbines and all sorts of um, renditions of that that all have different utilization efficiencies. And so um, all of that basically is put into this very famous uh, McKelvey um, diagram where we know an identified reserve that we know is economic and is being produced now. Um, in areas where it's undiscovered, where the geologic assurance or the uncertainty is, is, um, is low or where the uncertainty in the geologic conditions is great, that is an undiscovered, undiscovered resource. And going down the y-axis is basically the cost of depth. How viable is it to drill wells really deep? At Sulsa, for example, five kilometers, that's a very expensive operation. So these are the undiscovered resources. And then these parts right here might be the residual that eventually might become accessible, but um, not at current um, prices. So um, that's, as I mentioned, a huge effort in the energy resources program. And the most up-to-date, although not quite new map is this geothermal favorability map of Williams in 2008 with co-workers. And I've showed this map before. You'll recognize here it's the heat convolved with the fractures, with the recovery or um, recovery efficiency. So you see the influence of faults, whether that's actual a resource along the San Andreas or not, but in the um, in the methods of convolving this, that this is taken into account. So this is uh, where that factors in. And so what I want to close with to really show you that this is something worthwhile, not from not only from a scientific perspective, but also from a economical and um, climate change or impact on climate change reduction perspective is that the megawatts identified, electric megawatts identified, you know, the, this is dominated by salt and sea, coal, so the geysers in California, about 2,400 megawatts. The undiscovered resource is not all that much bigger because we, we kind of know where they are. These play fairway methods certainly have a way of expanding that. Um, so they're about a factor of two, maybe a little more larger than um, what um, and the discovered resources. But the EGS resource really where we don't have to rely on the Goldilocks condition of being at a particular part of a fault that provides the crustal permeability is to expand EGS. And the big player here is, of course, Nevada, which has a lot of available shallow heat uh, across a big area, not just an isolated magmatic area or volcanic area. 
And so um, what this comes out to in this assessment, which um, to date is still the most um, reliable one, in my opinion, that uh, about 345,000 megawatts electric in the lower 48 can be produced. And I think what these uh, new projects like uh, Utah Forge, which obviously is not commercial, but a research project and the Fervable Mountain project shows is that is a target that's uh, that's useful. Um, that corresponds to roughly half of the currently installed or 2008 installed electric power generation capacity in the US. So this is a this is a big number. And so uh, in summary and conclusion, I've mentioned this throughout. Um, it's a fascinating field of study because it requires so many different aspects of or sciences. It has a very long and storied history of research at the USGS, but it also is a natural lab for many other aspects relevant to tectonic earthquakes and deformation because the earthquakes and the faults are generally shallow and we have some information on the pore pressure diffusion in there and the heat distribution in the reservoirs. Obviously access to production and injection data is it's not always easy, but there's some very cooperative um, operators out there. And I think what I've convinced you on the slide prior to this one is that has a really significant potential for sustainable and green energy uh, that can usher in um, an era of uh, combating greenhouse gas emissions and providing a viable long-term um, source that is a base load, base load um, energy source that can complement um, energy sources like renewable energy sources like wind and solar. And with that, I'll leave you with these two pictures of Mr. Grant's first wall at the geysers and this the producing uh, doublet at Blue Mountain just a couple months ago. And that picture is courtesy of Jack Novick. Thanks very much. Oh, thank you so much, Ole. That was great. <laughs> just a great overview of all the research going on geothermal wise at USGS and the history and how seismicity ties in just all really interesting and really fascinating to learn about. So we have gotten some questions in and just a reminder for everybody, please feel free to uh, submit a question um, if you have any. Um, you can click the uh, question mark icon in the upper right hand corner of your screen. That's the Q&A chat window. So I'll go ahead and start. Let's see here. So Kathy asked a question. Um, this came in fairly early on in the talk, and she says, what is meant by meteoric water? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. I, I might have not explained that well enough. Meteoric water is basically water coming from the surface. This can be rainfall that percolates into the ground surface and nearby lakes and so on. That's meteoric water that circulates through um, this big loop that um, on white Bob Fournier and folks envision happening at Yellowstone and at uh, Steamboat Springs. Great. Um, another one that came in. Scroll back up here. OK, so this person was anonymous and they said, OK, so I understand the USGS does the research, but where does it go from there? If you find an area suitable with geothermal activity, what's the next step? Are you partnering with Department of Energy? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the USGS is tasked to do these energy resource assessments, and that's not just limited to geothermal energy. Uh, they've, this has been done for coal, for oil, gas, um, and minerals for a long time. So um, these maps are regularly updated and provided to the public, to operators. Um, anybody can use them. So these are favorabilities. How likely are you to encounter a resource there? So that's one of the products where you know, that's put out to the public and operators may use that as they wish. Um, we in both the Energy Resources Program and the Earthquake Science Center collaborate a lot with the Department of Energy, especially for these efforts like the FORGE, the Frontier Observatory of Research in Geothermal Energy in Utah, to understand the nuances of these things. Of course, the, the general theme that I outlined here that explains sort of the, the zero and first order effects, but there's a lot more, you know, de the devil is in the detail as I showed before. So we partner with these folks to try to advance the um, understanding knowledge um, of these systems, how we can better um, engineer uh, these EGS systems, for example, how we can mitigate um, the hazard of induced seismicity from those. So there's a number of 
of aspects to it that the USGS involved in. I certainly am not doing justice to all of those efforts. Okay, thanks. Um, this just this one just came in from Kent. Um, he says the mitigation efforts. What are the efforts? Length of the horizontal well, pressure, specific fluid, other question mark. Yeah, that's a good question. I had to brush over that since I was running out of time. So what's generally done in these traffic light systems is a certain magnitude or a ground motion at the surface is set as your threshold. Because really what you're worried about in these things is a ground motion that can either um, disturb or damage uh, surface infrastructure. In some places, the nuisance alone of ground motion is enough. Uh, what comes to mind is a gas field in the Netherlands or basically uh, nuisance was enough for that to eventually be terminated. So when you have this traffic light system, and it's not always just three colors, some, some operators like to do many more colors, is you have certain pro process of what you can do. Obviously, the only thing you really have control over is, is the fluid and the pressure in which you put the fluid down. So what some operators may do, they may stop the stimulation and keep pressure steady um, or do uh, no more injection. It's not necessarily always a good idea to pump everything out right away because the, the sudden change in stresses on these fractures or faults that you might encounter um, obviously can act uh, pretty, pretty differently. That's where the site characterization before you do anything really comes into play, knowing as best as you can the fractures and faults that are down there, then designing with modeling studies what what is the best case scenario if we encounter this fault? Do we flow back fluid? Do we keep it steady or do we just reduce the injection? And then if you get to your sort of your terminal color, your red color, generally it's seizing all operations um, for the time being. Um, so that's the that's the mitigation strategy. But a big portion of it, the mitigation is really the acceptance by the public. So the communication of the hazard and the risk to the public before, during, and after is really important. And the only way, of course, that any of this can be done is to do really dedicated monitoring at these sites, seismic monitoring. Okay, thank you. Um, another one here came in, how closely do you work with the energy group at the USGS? Actually, 100% of my salary comes from the energy group, um, and I've worked very closely with a number of folks uh, from the, um, uh, GRIP project, geothermal research, uh, geothermal resource investigations project. Okay. Um, another one from anonymous. Um, so I understand geothermal energy is cheaper, but what about the earthquakes that could cause damage? Yeah. So, um, good question. Um, I hope I I elucidated that there are ways to to get around that. You know, Basel is one of the cases where it had, wasn't a really big earthquake, a 3.4 by, you know, Bay Area standards, for example. That's a, that's, that's a pretty common place and, uh, you know, people wake up to it, but nothing really happens. If you do it in a city center that's not used to earthquakes like these, and what comes to mind is the induced seismicity crisis across the central and eastern U.S. starting in 2011 related to oil and gas exploration, so that that is is a big issue. So it's what we generally evaluate is the hazard. How much ground shaking can you possibly produce, or what's the likelihood of that? The risk portion then is how much damage can you do with that ground shaking to infrastructure and people. And so those are really important aspects. You know, somebody may go to northern Nevada, uh, make a geothermal resource, make a magnitude three and nobody will feel it and no damage will, will take place. So it really depends on the setting, where you can do it, um, who's around, what infrastructure is around, and how you can do it safely. And so um, the earthquakes are a big concern uh, for all of the operators, certainly for the USGS, and people take it very, very seriously. Hey, great. More keep coming in the more we're talking here. Um, Barbara Beacons, uh, she asked, has the traffic light system for preventing large earthquakes during EGS been adopted by the state of Nevada? Uh, hi, Barbara. Uh, thanks for the question. That's a, uh, that's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry, but I, I'll try to find out for you. Okay, I think she knows where to find you, so. <laughs> um, 
Another one here, can USGS do home property assessments that have the potential of geothermal energy? Uh, if I understand the question right, uh, is this a home? It sounds like, yeah, they're asking home oh, property assessment. Okay, so I think where this is going is whether a heat pump is a viable resource for a particular house. Um, I don't think we have the capacity to do that. Um, I don't really know. It's not my area of expertise, um, so I'm I'm going to guess no, but uh, I, I'm not sure. Okay, no worries. Um, looks like there's one more here. Um, how does geothermal versus fossil economics play out? Seems like geothermal would be lower operating costs over the long run. Uh, I mean, this that's, that's a great question, but it's also a very, very loaded question. Um, the one thing that I like to point out with geothermal is you drill wells, you produce the fluid. There's certainly um, the economics of that is, is is pretty steep and the chances of success uh, in many places haven't been great, but that obviously is improving. When you look at the life cycle of a geothermal resource, the only um, sort of output of it is generally steam. And so there's really no harmful byproduct of that. If you were to look at the life cycle of oil and gas, where a producer does not have to pay for the the life cycle cost of emitting the gas once you once you burn it, it's a much different value proposition. And so they're not directly applicable. They're not directly comparable. Uh, the economics in that sense, the economics of just producing electricity from it um, they've been laid out pretty clearly. The Lazar 2020 study compares all of those values. Um, and of course, oil and gas is, um, or the energy produced from it is generally cheaper, but the US actually doesn't burn a whole lot of oil uh, for electricity generation. So it's again, a little bit different operation, but uh, it's a very loaded, complicated question. I'm certainly not the right person to answer it. Um, I hope the figure early in the plot where the levelized cost of geothermal versus coal, nuclear, all of the other renewables uh, and um, uh, and gas uh, electric production helps with that. <clears throat> OK, well, great. I, I think that's all that we have at the moment question wise. So um, yeah, thank you so much, Ole, for taking time out of your schedule to give this lecture. Um, thank you to everyone out there for tuning in tonight and asking all these great questions we were able to get to. Um, and just in case you want to watch this lecture again or share it with others, Ole's lecture will be available in about a week for on-demand viewing on our public lecture website, which is on your screen. It's www.usgs.gov slash PLS. Uh, on that website, you'll find videos of past lectures uh, spanning the past 30 years that we've had this series going and our lecture schedule for the rest of the year. Um, and pretty soon we'll have details on lectures for 2024 on there as well. Um, and if you want to be part of our email list, um, we just send one or two emails a month, just giving you a heads up on the lecture topic. You can send us an email at WMCESIC at USGS.gov and we can add you to our list. And finally, we do hope you'll join us again next month on October 19th um, at 6 p.m. Pacific time for Han Ips. Uh, he's our diagnostic virologist, and he's going to give a talk on our USGS National Wildlife Health Center. So again, thank you to Ole for the great talk. Thanks to all of you for joining us, and I hope everybody has a good evening. Good night. Thank you. Good night.